Welcome to another episode of Electable. I'm Deb Chubb, and this podcast is sponsored by Indiana Women's Action Movement. Today, um, we are very excited to be with Rahul. Oh, gosh, pronounce your last name for me again. Durai. Durai, sorry, Rahul Durai, <laughs> um, a sophomore at West Lafayette High School, who is the operations director and the legislative director for the group Confront the, Cr- the Climate Crisis. Did I say that right? Yep. Oh, good, good. Okay. All right. Well, welcome, Rahul. Thank you so much for, for doing this. Deb, no problem. Thank you for having me, Deb. Great. So um, so I want to get right into it. Um, tell us about your organization and um, you know what all you're doing. Uh, and then we're going to talk about last session uh, at this Indiana State House. And then we're going to talk about what's coming up next year. So tell us first about your organization. Yeah, absolutely. So Confront the Climate Crisis is a statewide organization of high school students from across the state of Indiana um, advocating for climate action. We launched in September of 2020. Um, I was part of the launch and um, we mainly launched with um, West Lafayette students. So um, some kids at my high school in West Lafayette had been striking for the climate since May of 2019. And for a few years, they had been in this movement. Um, They passed um, some local um, legislation in West Lafayette for West Lafayette to confront the climate crisis. And for about two years, um, they had been working hard on a local level to advocate for climate action. And there, were all, there have also been other groups across the state, other youth groups. Um, there have been um, several youth in Indianapolis and Carmel who have been striking at the state house uh, for the climate for a few years. There had also been a group in Northwest Indiana in the Gary area who had been um, advocating for climate action and protesting against climate change. And in September of 2020, we realized and accepted the fact that statewide officials in the state of Indiana were not listening to us, to the youth groups across the state who have been protesting. So we decided that we need to unite the different youth climate groups from across the state and unite all of them into a statewide campaign to have a united push for climate action in the state of Indiana. So that's why we launched Confront the Climate Crisis. It was an effort to bring all of the youth in Indiana together into this movement for climate action. Um, And over the past, approximately the past year, we've been able to grow a lot into many different cities. At the beginning, it was mainly just my peers and I in West Lafayette, um, kids from Indianapolis, Carmel, Gary, Hammond, uh, we, we've had a few kids, um, we, we started with a few kids in Kokomo and Alexandria. Um, since then, we've been able to expand a bit more. We have kids in Terre Haute now, in Evansville, in Fort Wayne. Um, we also have uh, someone from Muncie. So we've been able to grow um, and really achieve that mission of uniting kids across the state in the name of statewide climate action. And we've also been able to do some events um, over the past year. I'll note most of the work we've been doing um, in our campaign have been on Zoom. They've been virtual and it's been quite convenient because we all live across the state and it isn't practical to um, meet up every time we want to work on something or discuss something, but we have been privileged Um, to be able to um, do some events, in-person events, and meet up and, um, you know, march and, um, you know, um, put on some climate strikes in in March of this year, towards the end of the legislative session. During my spring break, we held a climate strike at the State House. Um, We essentially were outside at the State House. It was a very sunny day. And we chanted, we spoke, and we yelled, and we marched around the state house advocating for climate action. We were also joined by 
um, some incredible legislators, State Representative Chris Campbell and State Senator Fadi Kadura. Mm -hmm. And so that was a great day. And in June, we held an art event at the State House where we brought um, together a bunch of different people. And outside the State House, we um, had a bunch of different booths with activities, with um, you know artistic stuff. And we also had some speeches and some music. Um, I got to play guitar at that event. And Great. we had an event this past September with uh, my state senator, State Senator Ron Alting. This was in West Lafayette. And it was an incredible day. Um, about 200 students from my school, West Lafayette um, Junior Senior High School, came out and striked from school to join us at this event to protest for climate action. So yeah, over the past year, we've been able to um, you know, organize youth together in the name of statewide climate action. That's excellent. So, and it is great, you know, I'm old, so it's really just so heartening to see young people really, you know, being so passionate about this issue and other issues, but this, this one is just so important. I can't imagine mm -hmm. what it's like to be a young person now and think about mm -hmm. what the future holds right. um, when everybody older than you seems to be just letting the earth slip away. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so I wanna talk to you um, uh, really about your legislative work um, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about other things too, but I wanna talk about that, that's really important. So um, tell us about some of the bills that you worked on in the 2021 legislative session in Indianapolis. Um, give us the highlights. What was terrible? Uh, what was good? And what happened? Right. Well, yeah, the 2021 legislative session was a tough one. Um, a lot of bad bills that passed. And the, the good stuff was minimal, although there was still some good stuff there. Um, I mean, the first one that comes to everyone's mind is the anti-wetlands bill, Senate Bill 389 which unfortunately is Senate Enrolled Act 389 after it was signed by the governor. Um, you know, if you recall, the introduced bill was a bill to basically eliminate all state, state level protections for Indiana's wetlands. So it, the, the original bill, it basically, you know, eliminated um, Indiana's wetland statute from the Indiana code. And, I mean, it was horrible. It, and, and the, the senator that introduced it, introduced it directly for um, a specific organization known as the Indiana Builders Association. So we have a pretty, um, I, mean, that, I mean, it's just a great example of, you know, the, what, what, what people hate about politics where, um, you know, for-profit interests are directly, um, uh, determining or determining um, what legislation gets passed and for their interests, not for the interests of Indiana and for Hoosiers. And that bill had quite a journey throughout the um, session. You know, it, it, it passed the Senate in a really bad form, passed the Senate in a form that, you know, eliminated all of the protections for wetlands. And when it went to the House, the House Committee on Environmental Affairs passed a compromised version. So um, the chair of the Environmental Affairs Committee, Representative Doug Gutwein, he had done a good job working with different stakeholders on the issue and working on a compromised bill. And what came out of that committee was a bill that was, uh, you know, a, a compromised bill that was supported by that was supported by the environmental groups. It was supported by the Hoosier Environmental Council. It was supported by the different, you know, conservation groups and land trusts across the state. It was also supported by the Indiana Farm Bureau, which was an important stakeholder in um, this um, process. And, and it was a great moment when that passed committee. Now that bill went to the house floor and it was amended and it came out of the house quite bad again. And the version that came out of the House, it didn't eliminate the entire wetland statute, but it, it, it was much worse than that compromised version that passed the House committee. So that passed the House, and then the Senate 
concurred with the House amendments, and then it went to the governor's desk and he signed it. So you know, that- you, make, you make it sound, I mean, you're, you're giving the highlights and, um, but, um, you know, I remember, I mean, the outrage um, right. by environmentalists, and it really speaks to the lack of true representation in right. the state house, um, given that there were over a hundred environmental organizations who had, you know, signed in opposition to right. this bill. And the marches, the, you know, I know you were there, everybody was there, mm-hmm. uh, everybody was calling, everybody was emailing, petitioning um, against mm-hmm. that bill. And, um, and it really does demonstrate so clearly um, what happens when we have a supermajority as a result of gerrymandering and voter suppression and election laws that allow people to pass these bills and still get reelected because right. they be, you know, because uh, they're, you know, they're in these safe districts and it doesn't matter what they do. Uh, they don't have to be held accountable to the constituents of the state of Indiana. So, um, and that was just such a glaring example of that. And those people I'm sure will run again in 22 and will get elected again in 2022. I mean, despite this just massive outrage. So, um, so yeah, it got passed and, you know, you know, it, it stinks. It wasn't as bad as when it started. And I know right. there was a task force that was uh, established as part of that bill. And I am, mm-hmm. you know, somewhat, at a, you know, a hopeful about that task force. Um, I, I guess I, I, I don't, I don't know yeah. if nobody's educating the builders associations in Indiana. I know that I've had experiences with builders in, um, you know, mm-hmm. in Indiana who really truly do not understand the value of wetlands. Um, and it's shocking to me. I mean, you know, I'm old and I know that everyone younger than me has had a very solid education on the importance of wetlands. Um, And I know a lot about wetlands and Mm -hmm. how important they are to, you know, water quality and, you know, habitat for critters. And so it's just, it's just shocking. Uh, And of course, you know, I couldn't believe that you couldn't even talk to them about the, uh, the terrible impact on flooding that would result from destroying wetlands. Uh, did no one could even see that builders couldn't even really get their head around that terrible possibility, which we have seen in in Indiana in different locations. Uh, Northwest Indiana had just a horrible time in you know the early two thousand terrible flooding, terrible, terrible, um, and mm-hmm. you know resulting in the you know set up a commission on the Kankakee River Valley. Um, uh, but anyway, I won't you know it's easy to to digress, isn't it? So okay, that was a terrible bill, um, and. Um, and uh, we did talk a little bit earlier about about the the wind turbine standards bill that Republicans couldn't get passed, and um, it's it was shocking to me that they couldn't get this done. And it, it was a home rule uh, bill, you know, that was going to take away home rule on uh, land development, and and mm-hmm. that killed it. But um, oh, there's just so many there's so many things to talk about, and I so appreciate. Um, that you are so knowledgeable about all of this legislation. So, okay, any other bills from 2021 that you think are important to talk about? Yeah, um, well, I mean, like you mentioned, um, House Bill 1381, um, that, you know, the the bill to create statewide standards for wind and solar siting, which, I mean, was a great idea because so many counties in Indiana, such as my own county, have, you know, put so much restrictions on um, wind and solar. My county, Tippecanoe County, has banned uh, wind turbines um, of a certain size. And that was a bill that was proposed um, with from the Republican caucus because um, they were responding to the needs of wind and solar companies. So they weren't exactly um, supporting the bill because of climate change. I mean, that's why I would support a bill like that, because, you know, we're in a climate emergency, but, but they, I mean, Representative Soliday, Senator Messmer had different motivations and still they couldn't get the Republican caucus totally behind it. So that bill died in the Senate. Um, It's just just so interesting. I think there's just, uh, I think there's just something hidden that we don't know about that because of course it made no sense for Ed Soliday to be promoting, um, statewide standards yeah. for a wind and solar um, when the year before he was, you know, pushing this bill yeah. to make it harder for coal burning industries to, uh, to, to shut down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, you know, exactly. it doesn't make any sense at all. I think there's something in there that we just don't know about yet. Yeah, no, definitely. 
It's, All right. Any other bills years. from so are there bills that were in 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 the uh, legislature in 2021 um, that you'd hope would get passed but didn't and might come back? Yeah. So so there were some. There was a bill that um, was quite inspiring with a, a, like a pretty amazing bill, and it it passed the Senate, but um, it, it ended up not crossing the finish line. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Senate Bill 373 was authored by State Senator Sue Glick. Um, she represents the northeast corner of our state. Um, she's from like the Angola, Howe area, and she chairs the Senate Natural Resources Committee. She's quite um, a strong, inspiring state senator. And she introduced Senate Bill 373, which created a carbon credit market, or which would have created a carbon credit market for Indiana. And uh, for anyone who isn't super familiar with um, what these markets are, essentially um, what happens is corporations that want to achieve carbon neutrality put money into the carbon credit market. They're essentially investing money into the carbon credit market. And then farmers and foresters who um, do work to sequester carbon in regener regenerative ways you know, take CO2 out of the atmosphere and put it into the ground in a, in a safe way, they would get compensated for that. So it's an incentive for our farmers and our foresters to help um, stop the climate crisis. And um, it, it was introduced by, um, you know, a Republican senator, Senator Glick. It had widespread bipartisan support. It was, I mean, it was supported by, you know, the Hoosier Environmental Council. It was supported by uh, the Nature Conservancy. It was supported by the Indiana Farm Bureau because, you know, um, farmers see that there is potential and they want to be part of this effort to mitigate climate change. And, and that bill, you know, it was a great bill. It passed the Senate, which was amazing yeah. um, that a bill like this was able to, you know, that a climate bill was able to cross that um, hurdle of passing the Senate. Now, in the House Natural Resources Committee, it was amended. So, and, and it, it didn't look pretty after that. So basically there was a representative from the Terre Haute area, um, representative um, Alan Morrison, and he had put in language there that would have, um, so there's this um, company in, in the Terre Haute area called Wabash, uh, Wabash Valley Resources, I believe. And they're basically, a, you know, this company, like um, it, it's basically an ammonia plant where they sequester carbon from the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, and then they um, inject it into the ground, right? They inject all of the CO2 in the ground. It's carbon capture and, and storage, carbon capture and storage or CCS. You know, they put it into the ground and it's going, um, um, you know, usually thousands of feet under the ground, but sometimes less than that. And, um, and you know, some people like that. Um, some people think that's a good way to stop climate change because you're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. But from a public safety standpoint, that is, that makes a lot of people hesitate because, I mean, you're, you're I mean, yeah, maybe you're, um, helping mitigate climate change, but you're kind of creating more problems by doing that because, well, that CO2 in the ground, that could come into contact with groundwater and then be a hazard to drinking water. So, so this is a project that's going on in Terre Haute and Representative Morrison put in an amendment that passed in committee that would have made this company immune from liability um, from, you know, homeowners that live near the project that would have where, you know, CO2 would be below their houses in the ground. And so <laughs> that's what happened to the bill and it passed the house that way. And then Senator Glick bravely took out that language in the conference committee, but because she did that, it ended up dying and, you know, the house and Senate didn't, weren't able to get it to the governor's desk, so. Wow, well, yeah. Congratulations. I mean, it's lovely to hear about a great Republican um, mm -hmm. senator out there doing work to improve the environment. So 
Good for her. Exactly. But that is something that um, may come back, you think? Might she try again? Yeah, definitely. I'm, I've not spoken with her specifically about that, but I imagine we'd see this um, initiative try to get passed again. But I'm also wary because I know that that um, Wabash Valley Resources Company is still out there lobbying and is going to probably try to do the same thing this year. So. You know, um, when you mentioned that, it reminded me of the, um, they called it a high powered deep well injection. Um, mm. and, and up here in Northwest Indiana, the industries do it. It's unregulated. You don't have to get a permit and uh, you mm. can inject waste into the ground. Like, you know, it's like half a mile to, you know, 20, 2,500 feet, something like that into the ground. And, and I remember, you know, meeting with them and saying, well, well, where does it go? And, and they're like, well, we don't really know. And so, so anyway, so I'm, I'm also a little wary of this notion of this high powered injection, you know, into the earth, um, a couple of thousand feet down, um, because, you know, we do rely on aquifers <laughs> for right. drinking water and, uh, no one knows, you know, where the plume goes, you know, geologists can, you know, make a, you know, guess. Um, but, um, but yeah, that, that would be frightening to me as well. Okay. Well mm -hmm. that let's then move to the 2022 session. Um, you mm -hmm. mentioned that you're working on a bill with representative Alting, right? Senator Alting. Yeah. Senator Alting. I'm sorry. So oh, tell us fine. about that. Yeah. So I've been working on this with my team for the past several months in May of this year. So a few weeks after the legislative session ended, um, my peers and I um, in West Lafayette, we met with our state senator, uh, Senator Ron Alting, in our high school library. Um, I'd, re I'd requested a meeting with his office and Senator Alting was willing to meet. And we met with him in our library on a school day. And we had proposed to him a, a climate resolution that um, we had written, a climate resolution for Indiana. So. I mean, I know, um, you know, many people are familiar. Um, so many cities across our state have passed climate resolutions. Right. And um, our organization is a, you know, a statewide organization. So we um, were thinking in the next legislative session, we want to do something statewide. So we had proposed a climate resolution that we had written to Senator Alting. And that was such an amazing day. He was totally on board um, with the, the proposal. Um, I mean, Senator, Senator Alting is just an amazing, an amazing guy. Um, he, he's a true statesman, in my opinion. And um, so we had his commitment. And for several months, we, you know, we, we got to work and um, we, we'd been working on, we wanted to work on this legislation and make sure that going into session, um, there, Senator Alting was introducing legislation um, that was smart, that was strategic, that was a good way for Indiana to become a climate leader. And the way it stands, so um, after a few months of working on this, we kind of um, have, have come with a product that Senator Alting is gonna, gonna file in the Indiana Senate um, in January. So it's gonna be um, two pieces of legislation, a climate resolution and a climate bill. So the resolution is going to be a statement on behalf of the General Assembly acknowledging the problem of climate change. It'll acknowledge the problem of climate change. It'll put um, scientific research about climate change, particularly research from Purdue, on the record and you know, make sure all of the senators know about it and make sure that our General Assembly endorses that research. And it will also address the economic development and the workforce development that Indiana can achieve through sustainability and through climate action. You know, it'll talk about how we can create jobs, how we can, um, you know, um, develop our workforce, how we can enhance our quality of place through climate action and through sustainability. So that's what the resolution does. The bill goes a step further. It creates a statewide climate task force um, it, it would be called a Climate and Environmental Justice Task Force. And this would be a task force that exists from May of 2022 to November of 2022. And it would contain 17 members. These members would be experts representing a diverse set of backgrounds. 
So there would be four legislators on the task force and the other 13 members would be experts in you know, different industries, backgrounds, areas of study. We'd have a representative from the Purdue Climate Research Center, a representative from the IU Environmental Resilience Institute. Mm -hmm. And then we'd have um, you know, a myriad of different experts, a representative of our business community, a representative of um, you know, Indiana's farmers, someone with experience in electric utility policy, a representative of Indiana's labor unions, um, someone, you know, an expert in conservation, an expert in public health, and an expert in environmental justice issues. And we'd also have a youth activist on the task force. Um, we put that in there because we thought we were an important right. stakeholder. Yes. And um, during the, um, the ter during the several months that this task force exists, it would start a statewide conversation about climate change and how Indiana can be a climate leader. And then it would create a climate action plan, basically a comprehensive report of recommendations for the General Assembly regarding climate um, policies. So, so that's what the bill does. And you know, obviously this is, this is just the first step. This is just the initial step that Indiana needs to take. Um, you know, this doesn't go far enough, but it does get the process started. It does, it, it does get us started. It does put Indiana somewhere and um, it, it, you know, sets Indiana up to be ready to pass uh, legislation that would systematically um, mitigate climate change and also develop our economy um, simultaneously. So that's what Sundra Alting is going to introduce, and that's our number one mission right now. That's yeah. excellent. Um, yeah, I, that you're right. That's the first step: making public conversation um, happen and bringing together, you know, the great minds uh, who can work on this, mm. along with those who, you know, maybe aren't great yet. <laughs> you know, right. but you know, I mean, sure. people who are in business who, you know, like I say, I, I was shocked to find that, you know, I, people who run large construction companies really didn't even know what a wetland was. Didn't even mm. know why, you know, why can't we just build on it? Uh, right. And um, I, it was kind of shocking. So, so this is a terrific method to bring those mm -hmm. people in, bring those people to the table and, you know, get them educated and uh, let them learn more about the impacts of what they're doing. So, well, that's mm -hmm. awesome. I really, yeah, I'm very hopeful for you. And of course, um, uh, I assume uh, uh, you'll be seeking a, uh, support from other legislators um, on that yeah. bill as well. And, uh, and mm -hmm. hopefully that will, uh, hopefully that will carry, carry it through. Um, yeah, so far. Yeah, like you said, um, we've been able to get a few senators who have agreed to be co-authors on the legislation. Okay. Yeah, so Senator Sue Glick, who authored the, that um, carbon credit market bill. Also, Senator Mike Bohachek from your area, oh, yeah, um, yeah. Michigan yeah. City area, he's agreed to be a co-author. Uh, John Ford from Terre Haute, nice. and then we're also going to have Fatty Kadora and J.D. Ford from the Carmel, Indianapolis area on the legislation. Um, you know, and, and I, 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 I'm really happy that we have, um, that's like six, I think, um, six senators who are, you know, standing together and saying we want Indiana to be a climate leader, and I'm hoping we can get some more, and um, and yeah, going into the session, we're going to do our best to bring some momentum and make sure, first of all, make sure we get a committee hearing for this legislation in the Senate. That's awesome. So yeah, um, I think you're, you're, you're so great to bring in all these people that know everything. Um, I've been so impressed with the Purdue Climate Change Report that they've mm -hmm. done. Uh, really wonderful. And they did a, a terrific like tour, you know, of the of the report, they would go around and uh, give presentations of it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was really great about this uh, report that they did was they were able to show the impact of climate change right. on all different sorts of industries, you know, not right. just on farming, but on tourism, which, you know, mm -hmm. many you know, like the, us out here, Lake Michigan, many of our communities are relying more and more on tourism. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, how will climate change impact our ability to continue that industry? 
Um, so, and really how it impacts all kinds of other industries as well. So, um, you know, it was, a, it was a great thing. And then of course, IU also has their uh, Institute of Resiliency and something, something, something. Yeah. Yeah. And they're terrific too. And they have worked with uh, local communities. Um, I helped um, establish our sustainability committee commission here in Michigan City. And, um, and, and they provide all of these tools for local communities to assess the CO2 levels in their town and to develop right. action plans to work on reducing those CO2s in their community. So both of the great Indiana universities, biggest ones, doing terrific work. And there mm -hmm. is a lot going on. And I think that particularly people in the legislature just really aren't aware of, of all of that right. information and study uh, right. that is out there. Um, so we don't really need to keep studying this. We, we right. you know, exactly. we, we have these great reports and we actually have great, you know, toolkits um, for mm -hmm. our communities that our universities have produced based on very good science. So, um, so it, it is great to bring that to the legislature and, uh, and hopefully mm -hmm. we can do more of that. All right. Any other bills that you foresee coming up in 2022? Oh yeah, I mean, there are, I mean, several bills that um, the environmental movement in Indiana is um, working hard on. Um, your state um, legislators, Pat Boy and Rodney yep. Pohl are gonna introduce coal ash bills. Um, you know, you know bring it, bringing it back to our local communities, coal ash is such a bad problem in our state, right? I mean, I don't need to tell you, Deb. That's right, um, we have more coal ash lagoons in Indiana than any other state. Yeah, and of course they are all situated right by water sources. Lake Michigan, you know the the big rivers. Every you know they're situated right where people get their drinking water from. Right, I'm, it's just ridiculous, right? And I mean, I mean, well, legislate some legislators know about it, and not but non left legislators are educated about how you know how horrible this is for public health. I mean, coming out of a pandemic, how like you know, what, how large of an impact this has on um, people's bodies, and particularly, you know, vulnerable communities um, are put at most risk and are the ones who are living near um, these coal ash ponds. Um, so yeah, Representative Boy and Senator Pohl are gonna introduce some bills for clean clo closure of coal ash ponds. Um, and yeah, Hopefully. and I think another aspect of that bill, I um, I haven't seen it yet. I know I know Pat Boy's mm -hmm. working on it, but um, I haven't seen it. But I have been very involved in the you know the coal ash issue up here in Michigan City because our coal burning uh, electricity producing uh, company is closing up. They're going to stop. So mm -hmm. of course the issue of you know cleanup has come up, and uh, and we have been very fortunate to have great. Uh, activists uh, who are demanding, you know, some justice for the communities who live right around there. Um, the cleanup, you know, it could be kind of disastrous for the local communities. Right. Of course, these industries right. are situated right next to communities um, of lower income families mm -hmm. and, um, and, fa and communities of color. And right. they are the most vulnerable to whatever method we decide or NIPSCO decides, or Duke Energy decides to yeah. use to clean up these cash of uh, these uh, coal ash um, lagoons, and so yeah. um, so that's just a huge part of this equation uh, that it has to be in, it has to include these communities that live around these coal ash lagoons uh, about how they are moved. But they do have to be moved. I know, uh, and they have mm -hmm. um, created some you know well lined pits to store it. Uh, of course, you know, none of this ever goes away, so it has to go right. somewhere, but uh, right. it needs to be in a lined pit uh, that none of these coal ash lagoons are lined. All of that um, mercury, arsenic, lead, all of those heavy metals uh, really leaching right into the soil. Um, and for us, right into Lake Michigan, where we get our drinking water. And of course, right. they're frankly, and not just leaching under the ground, but I mean, ours, like it's separated by, a, you know, a steel seawall that's kind of cracked, you know, it's old and <laughs> the seams yeah. are coming apart and it's leaking. So, um, yeah. so this is an urgent issue um, and, and, it, and it, it has to happen, but we do have to make sure that we're doing it in a way that's equitable and um, considers uh, communities mm -hmm. that are situated around there. 
So, um, so the, and it's complicated. You know, I've been working in environmental issues for many, many years. And I will tell you, that is the one thing you always know is that it's complicated. It's always complicated. Right. <laughs> There's always a lot of, um, a lot of perspectives to keep in mind. So, okay. So um, tell us more about what your plans are for your organization. How are you growing your organization? And uh, what are you, what are your plans for the organization in the future? Right. Well, I mean, as we talked about earlier, Deb, um, you know, one problem with youth organizations, high school organizations, college organizations, is that is that students graduate, right? Um, right? So, I mean, that's definitely an issue we have to consider. Like, right now, you know, th the majority of our leaders are seniors who many of them are going to, um, get, well, um, you know, they're going to go to college. Many of them are going to go out of state for college. Maybe that has something to do with the fact that Indiana is not being a good environmental leader, the state of Indiana, the government. <laughs> exactly. But, um, you know, there are those, those of us, I mean, I've been, you know, like I said, I'm old and I've been in Indiana for, you know, all of my life. And certainly that comes up, you know, here and there. And I'm sure it comes up for students a lot. You know, now is my yeah. opportunity to get out of here. And, um, <laughs> but I will tell you, I, you know, I left and went to college and, you know, I went some other places, but I came back. And, um, you know, your home is your home and right, you right. have to, you know, there's, there's such a commitment. I think, um, I think, I think most people feel that way. So maybe they'll go away for college and maybe they'll come back and help us. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, so, I mean, one issue we've had to grapple with is, um, I mean, we need more, you know, younger members to continue this organization happening. I mean, I'm fortunate to be a sophomore, so I'll be in the state for like two and a half or, uh, you know, I'll be a high school student for two and a half um, year, more years. Maybe I'll, I, I, I don't know where I'm going to go to college. But, um, but so that's something we're working on. We're trying to get more younger students. Um, you know, we've been able to do a good job on getting, you know, more people my age, like sophomores. And we're also trying to reach into, you know, more high schools and diversify geographically and diversify in other ways. Um, our membership, um, you know, who's leading our organization, um, you know, can, you know, we're, um, I, I think a mission of Confront the Climate Crisis is, can we engage more youth and more cities to grow our movement and to make our movement more credible and more representative of, um, you know, the state as a whole? And um, I mean, one thing, you know, one, one way that ties into legislative work is also, um, you know, by reaching into more high schools, you, you get to have influence on more state legislators. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, it, you know, one, one thing, um, in, you know, in my role that I really enjoy doing is, you know, getting to meet new people in new communities, especially high school students, and, um, you know, working with them on um, meetings with their state senators. Um, but, but definitely, you know, aside from our legislative stuff, you know, that's a huge mission of our campaign. And I'm really hoping that this movement in Indiana and, you know, the Confront the Climate Crisis movement um, will be here for a long time because the climate crisis isn't going anywhere. And it's, you know, environmental issues, environmental justice is going to continue to be a big issue in our state. And um, I, but I'm, I'm confident that this movement will continue to be as alive as it is today. Well, you've done yeah. just incredible work. You really have. I'm so impressed with, uh, you know, Thanks. your knowledge about, you know, even how legislation gets passed. Um, it's complicated and um, lobbying is difficult and it's confusing and it's not very transparent. Uh, and once the session starts, it feels like a whirlwind and it's hard mm -hmm. to, you know, keep control of it. And so, so it's hard. So you have done an outstanding job of really understanding it and uh, learning how to work with it. Uh, that mm -hmm. takes organizations forever. So you've done a great job. And so, um, all right, so we're out of time, but um, you know, if there's any last words of wisdom, anything you would love to ask people to do to support your work, what could people do to help you? Yeah, um, you know, I'd encourage people to, you know, the upcoming legislative session is, you know, less than a month away. It's, it's just a few weeks away. It's coming up. It starts on January 4th, and it's going to be impactful on our lives. 
there's going to be good bills, like the bills that, like, you know, particularly the legislation that my team is working on. And there are going to be some really bad bills in this upcoming legislative session. Um, I'm pretty confident about that, that there are going to be bad bills. And, you know, my wis words of wisdom, I guess, is everyone use your voice. Use your voice. I, I know, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, writing an email to their state legislator or calling their state legislator's office isn't super impactful. It really is impactful though. I mean, it really is. Um, you know, state legislators do care about that stuff, some more than others, but I mean, they do pay attention to it. They do monitor it. They actually have, you know, they have a paid legislative assistant who monitors, um, you know, what letters or emails come in and that um, talks to the, the legislator about it. So use your voice. Don't stay silent in this upcoming legislation, legislative session and don't ever stay silent in your, in your life. Just use your voice and make sure you are heard and make sure the government works for you. So, Excellent. Oh, yeah. that's wonderful. All right. Well, great. Well, thank yeah. you so much, Rahul, for joining me. This has really been fun um, and really gives me all kinds of hope. So thank you for that. Thank you, Dad. This was amazing.